This tape is being made in a definite moment of sorrow throughout the United States and the world and regards the assassination of the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, assassinated on November the 21st, 1963. I'm Dr. Robert R. Shaw, professor of thoracic surgery at Southwestern Medical School. Because of my position, I accepted the responsibility of taking care of Governor Connolly uh, following his injury. I want to say at the outset that the condition of the governor is quite satisfactory in view of the injury that he has sustained. He seemed to have been struck by just one bullet which entered the right posterior chest close to the shoulder blade and coursed downward along the chest wall taking out and fragmenting a portion of the fifth rib on the right. The bullet then emerged from the chest evidently struck his right wrist, fracturing the lower portion of the right radius, and then entered the left thigh where it was spent. The thigh wound is trivial. The fracture of the radius should heal without difficulty or without further disability. Our major problem was the sucking wound of the right chest wall because in making the wound of the chest, the fragments of the fifth rib became what we refer to as secondary missiles, and these caused a considerable amount of tissue damage in the point where the missile emerged from the chest. When the wound had been enlarged in order to remove damaged tissue, the lung could be inspected. It was found that there was a tear in the middle lobe of the lung, which had to be repaired. There was also a small hole in the lower lobe, undoubtedly due to a small rib fragment. This was of no consequence. The major problem was a matter of completely controlling all bleeding points, removing all damaged muscle and tissue, and then securing a tight closure of the chest wall so that the right lung could be re-expanded. The governor's condition was good during all of this. He was perfectly lucid before anesthesia was started. And from what we know about his injury and his condition at the present time, we have no reason to believe that he won't completely recover without significant disability of any sort. Um, now reporters who are standing here have uh, asked for questions. I wonder how long you will be required to stay. You will be in the hospital. It will be determined more by the clearing of the bruise to the right lung, and I would estimate that this would be in the neighborhood of 10 to 14 days. This doesn't mean that this injury will be completely clear by this time, but at least we should have a good idea as to the trend of the clearing. The, the, the trend of the clearing, uh, whether it is clearing or not. Yeah. Um, they asked, uh, the governor, yes, uh, a reporter asked if the governor knew he was, the president was dead. He said they didn't uh, tell him. No. They're now asking, is he out of surgery and resting comfortably in his room? Take care of the compound fracture of the right radius. As soon as that fit is finished, he will be taken to the recovery room where he will be 
carefully watched until he has regained all of his vital signs. Now his vital signs are good now, but we like to observe them for a period of time. This is a routine measure until blood pressure is stable, respirations are satisfactory, and until the governor is uh, fully recovered from the anesthesia. In other words, he's fully conscious, responding rationally to questions. They are asking now uh, a bullet was found in his leg. The bullet is in the leg. It hasn't been removed. This is a very insignificant factor, though. It will be removed. Left eye. But there's no significant injury to the left eye. Before he goes to the recovery room. It was asked, when will it be removed? I'm asking, will, uh, will he stay at this hospital? The doctor says it will be advisable. Has it been definitely determined one bullet? Uh, really, a reconstruction of what must have happened, but assuming, of course, that we know that the government was in, governor was in a sitting position. We know that the wound of entrance is alongside the shoulder blade here, that the wound of exit was here. We speculate that his arm were, perhaps was about in this position and that it fractured his arm here and then went on with him sitting into his left thigh. This is a matter of trying to reconstruct the trajectory of the bullet. He was shot from above and he was in a sitting position. So we feel that this is all one bullet. That, uh, a briefing from Parkland Hospital by one of the doctors in charge regarding the condition and the situation on Governor Conley. This was Governor Connolly. Uh, we're supposed to switch back to New York here in about 45, 50 seconds from Dallas, Texas. What do you have? Jay, Jay anything else you'd like to Perhaps add? the most poignant moment of this barely tragic day came as the president's body was taken from the hospital to an ambulance, which took it on to the airport and the flight back to Washington. Uh, his body was in a sealed bronze casket. Mrs. Kennedy walked quietly by the side of the casket down the long corridor from the emergency ward to the side of the ambulance, saying nothing, not crying, just walking by the side of her husband. That's it from Dallas for the moment. We'll be back as soon as we have further information, more details. Now back to New York. That was a a ABC's Bob Clark with Jay Watson of WFAA-TV in uh, Dallas. Those vital signs, of course, that the surgeon attending Governor Connolly was talking about are good pulse and good respiration. Governor Connolly has both in his estimation, and as you heard, he described how that one bullet, as he felt it must have been, ricocheted up through the governor's body. Now, the main suspect in this case, Lee Harvey Oswald. Here's what he looks like. He's the suspect being held in the assassination of President Kennedy. He's 24 years old, a resident of Fort Worth, where he heads a Fair Play for Cuba committee. He was arrested this afternoon in a Dallas theater after he shot a policeman to death when officers tried to pick him up there. He was pulled, literally screaming and yelling from that theater, uh, the Texas theater, by the way, in, Oak, in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas. He brandished a pistol, which officers took away from him after a scuffle. A policeman who was cut in the face during that scuffle quoted Oswald as saying, well, it's all over now. He's reported to have a Russian wife, and four years ago, while he was in Russia as a tourist, he informed the American embassy in Moscow that he was applying for Soviet citizenship. The questioning of Oswald stopped at 4.12 this afternoon. He's been put in jail, and as they say in Dallas, it looks good, meaning looks good as a suspect. We'll go now to Ed Morgan in Washington for an updated report from the nation's capital. Who did it? Who killed President Kennedy and why? Dispatches from Dallas tonight say that police are holding as a prime suspect in the assassination somebody whose last name is Oswald and who is identified with something called a Fair Play for Cuba Committee and is otherwise identified as an extreme left winger. Positive motives, of course, cannot be nailed down until the investigation goes much farther and this suspect could turn out to be not the one that they really want. Whatever the situation, there are other possibilities too. If the president had gone down into the heart of the seething racial crises in 
say Jackson, Mississippi, or Oxford, Mississippi, or Birmingham, Alabama, at the very height of the trouble, he might well have lost his life there. Indeed, if Spittle had been led, Adlai Stevenson, the American ambassador to the United Nations, might well have been dead too after an attack on him by so-called haters of the right wing in Dallas, coincidentally, a few weeks ago, haters who were denouncing Stevenson and the United Nations. The killers or the would-be killers of rulers, kings, presidents, are sometimes people with a cause, uh, often somewhat deranged. The man who tried but did not kill President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in, in Florida in 1933, but succeeded in fatally wounding Mayor Cermak of Chicago, was apprehended on the spot and was found to be deranged. The man that killed President Garfield was also off base, supposedly, as was the one who killed President William McKinley. John Wilkes Booth could hardly be called a deranged person. He was a gifted artist and actor, and he was a man who thought that he had a cause. Undoubtedly, these others thought they had a cause, too. Ironically enough, President Kennedy, at his last news conference just eight days ago, said at one point, in answer to a question about the fate of his legislation, particularly foreign aid, he said, I think it is a very dangerous, untidy world. I think we will have to live with it. And it is obvious that John F. Kennedy tried. As to the motives, as to the motives of whoever killed him, as to the identities of whoever killed him, that will have to remain for further developments. This is Edward P. Morgan in Washington. Thank you, Ed Morgan. The Mexican government, by the way, has announced through its Laredo offices that it has sealed the Texas-Mexican border for 72 hours. The arrangement for President Kennedy's state funeral are being made right now. Sergeant Shriver, the president's brother-in-law, is in charge working with military officials. The Kennedy's two children, Caroline and John, are still at the executive mansion. Their nurse, Mrs. Maud Shaw, uh, Miss Maud Shaw, rather, is with them. White House staff members have been notifying the other members of the president's family. Senator Edward Kennedy has flown to Hyannisport to be with the president's father, former Ambassador Joseph Kennedy, and right now it's assumed that the First Lady will go directly to the White House. That plane has arrived, or will arrive, in approximately a half hour at 6.05 Eastern Standard Time. Pope Paul VI prayed tonight for the soul of President Kennedy. The Pope received the news only a few minutes after the President died. President Kennedy has received uh, in audience, was received in audience by the Pope June 2nd during a visit in Rome. Another late picture from Dallas, Lyndon Johnson seen taking his oath of office as the 36th President of the United States. Mrs. Johnson is on his right and Mrs. Kennedy on his left. The judge administering the oath is a woman, Sarah T. Hughes. The ceremony took place aboard the Air Force jet that had brought the Kennedys to Texas, the same plane that's bearing the president's body back to Washington. From Downing Street, official residence of Prime Minister Sir Alec Douglas Hume, uh, these words tonight. The Prime Minister has learned with the most profound shock the horror of the death by assassination of the President of the United States. And Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko of the Soviet Union telephoned U.S. Ambassador Foy Kohler at midnight at the embassy a residence in Moscow to express his shock and greatest sympathy to the American peoples. Official condolences will be conveyed later at the highest level, he told the ambassador. This presumably meant from Premier Khrushchev himself. President uh, Lyndon B. Johnson We'll meet at the White House tonight with Defense Secretary Robert S. McNamara and White House National Security Aide McGeorge Bundy and then confer with the bipartisan leadership of Congress. The White House said that that meeting would take place as soon as the new president arrives at the executive mansion. He'll be flown there in a helicopter from Andrews Air Force Base in suburban Maryland. Johnson was expected to make a statement on his arrival at Andrews Air Force Base. The White House also said that the body of the president will lie in repose in the east room of the White House tomorrow between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. For a recap now of the last moments of the president's life, we go once again to WFAA-TV in Dallas.
Bob Walker, the news director of WFAA TV, the ABC coverage. Hey. understand why it is in rough form. The complete program from the time the president landed in Fort Worth to the present date. So Bob, if you will please, let's look at the... We'll begin at approximately 8.45 this morning when the president uh, came out in a misty rain, without a coat by the way, into a parking lot across the street. Well, this man ain't come out of this goddamn son of a bitch and dirty rotten paper quarter. ...rain this morning prior to his breakfast address people lining up uh, hours ahead of time mrs kennedy did not accompany him out this morning the president uh, drew a round of applause uh, when he said that she takes more time to pretty up than i do the president at 8:45 this morning uh, dallas time This is in Fort Worth. This was not on the regularly scheduled itinerary at first, but uh, some Democratic leaders had asked that uh, he do this, and he complied. Congressman Jim Wright of Fort Worth there briefly, along Vice President Johnson. The president was in an exceptionally jovial mood. Vice President Johnson introduced the president. The president speaking at approximately 8.50 this morning, Dallas time, in Fort Worth. Honor, the mayor and Mrs. Harold Campbell. This is J.R. Johnson. Mr. Johnson will introduce the president of the speech later this afternoon. There will also be others in the party that we've noticed. Dr. Lloyd S. Parker from the Graduate Research Center. Judge Fairman Sanders, Judge Bruce Sterrett. Walker at WFAA TV in Dallas. We are taking a look at the president's last hours, his final oh, hours today. Two. This is the arrival at Love Field of the vice presidential party. party. Air Force number two, which preceded Air Force one, carrying the president, Mrs. Kennedy, and his party. Uh, passengers from the vice presidential plane being greeted by the Dallas official welcoming delegation headed by Mayor Cavill. And very uh, slowly up the side comes uh, Air Force One. Swing open. In 
inside the door is seal of the President of the United States. Mrs. Cavill uh, approaching with some red roses. Military delegation coming off first. Shells even thinner for the Secret Service, whose job it is to guard the man. But the audience loves this. Mrs. Kennedy's uh, beautiful. And uh, now the uh, motorcade. The president has just left uh, Love Field, and now the motorcade. Starting out. This is on the the departure from Love Field. With more police than have ever been alerted for anybody in the history of Dallas. Our cameras are situated in a special truck. Open at the end to, to get these pictures. I've now been joined by Bob Clark from ABC News. 
who we've seen just earlier today, Bob, a member of the presidential party uh, from the time it left Washington. The overriding impression of those who were in the motorcade today was the warm and friendly scene. Uh, I haven't seen a police estimate. I think the total crowds must have been close to 200,000. It was an unusually friendly crowd. There was almost a complete absence of of uh, the type of signs, that the uh, insulting signs that a president often encounters on his trips around the country. Uh, a very warm crowd. It swelled as the motorcade approached downtown Dallas. Uh, it was a half dozen deep. There were, there were very few political signs except pro-Kennedy signs along here. Now we're coming up to the uh, part very shortly where the assassination took place, and this is it. People have just started to run. Policemen now to the area, policemen with drawn gun. The shots have just been fired. A state of mass confusion grips the entire area. People hitting the ground, rushing up. At this moment, the car bearing the president and his wife and the wounded Governor Conley sped off immediately to the hospital, which was just about uh, four or five miles from uh, the point where he was shot. people standing around on the sidewalks just after the president had been shot. He had actually not left the downtown area. Roadblocks, of course, immediately set up. He had uh, just started to uh, go under the triple underpass in Dallas, which uh, makes you out of the downtown area, out to Stimmons Expressway, where the trademark is located, where he was scheduled to speak at one o'clock which was the time he died. Now we are at the hospital, the Parkland Hospital, where the president died. Parkland Hospital on Harry Hines Boulevard in Dallas. This is the car. The press, some of the press, a weeping Senator Ralph Yarborough of Texas. Being consoled. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Yarborough, a personal fan of the president. City seekers. Police are moving the people back at this time. The president, uh, as of the moment these pictures were taken, was not dead. announcement of the death of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. This is inside Parkland Hospital and the official announcement to the press that the, that the uh, president is dead. three hours and 58 minutes now. He was pronounced dead at one o'clock Dallas time. Outside the hospital, people upon hearing the news begin to weep, Bobby, to pray. It's a Angels Air Force Base now, but. Utter disbelief, shock, sorrow, all the emotions. hospital in Dallas. These shots occurred just after the president was pronounced dead and the announcement was made to the public. 
shot on television shows many people crying. The cameras are now on crowd showing look of disbelief, grief, sadness, and sorrow uh, on, body, the, on body, the faces of the crowd. Yes, this was a very sad scene. Mrs. Kennedy walked down the emergency corridor of the hospital by the side of the heavy bronze casket. Congressman Jim Wright of Fort Worth, a close friend of the president. Now the presidential plane bearing the body of John Fitzgerald Kennedy as it leaves Dallas on its way to Washington. And I understand the plane is about to arrive there any moment and we'll try to have some coverage of that momentarily. Newsmen now being briefed of the swearing in of, vice, of the, the then Vice President Lyndon Johnson as the next president and he is now President of the United States. The oath of office was administered by federal judge Sarah T. Hughes of Dallas, a friend of President Johnson and the late President Kennedy. included the words that the Vice President spoke as he was sworn in. I do solemnly swear that I will perform the duties of the President of the United States to the best of my abilities and defend, protect, and preserve the Constitution of the United States. They filmed you just saw now, our SAR, at the Texas School Book Depository Building from where the President was assassinated. As the police descend upon the building, guns drawn, But the man was not there. Crowds gathered outside the building. Anybody who, uh, uh, almost anyone who heard the shots and saw anything at all. Now we're up in the place from where the bullet was fired. The bullets were fired. Texas Governor John Conley is in Parkland Hospital now in serious condition. He was shot in the chest. Secret Service FBI agents combing the area for any sorts of clues, fingerprints, what have you. Bits of food, particles were found, a box of chicken indicating the assassin had been there for some time. This is a scene on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building where the assassin stood and fired the shot that killed John F. Kennedy. It was an Australian Mauser, I believe. There is the weapon that was used to kill the president. That's the uh, homicide captain Will Fritz of the Dallas Police Department who is holding the weapon now. Actually, when these pictures were taken, the president was at Parkland Hospital. 
the book depository about is where the, the school the school books of the state of Texas are stored. You know, it's a storage place for books. Air Force One, the big jet on which President Kennedy made so many of his trips, uh, will be bringing him back to Washington this time for the last time. The plane which is carrying the president's body in a bronze casket also has now President Lyndon Johnson, as well as Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, the president's body will be taken to the White House to, of course, lie in state. Later, it probably will be taken to the Great Rotunda in the Capitol. Air Force One has touched down at Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, and... We, our cameras will be there momentarily to give you that complete story live. Leonard Goldenson, president of ABC, made the following announcement today. Because of the death of President John F. Kennedy, ABC Radio and Television will indefinitely devote their entire broadcasting to coverage of news relating to the tragic event. Here we go now to Washington and the arrival of President Lyndon Johnson. The presidential party is departing at dusk at Andrews Air Force Base. It arrived at 6.08. President Johnson is expected to make his first statement there as chief executive. And after that statement, he will fly to the White House aboard a helicopter to meet with Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and McGeorge Bundy, special assistant to President Kennedy, former President Kennedy on national security affairs. Acting White House Press Secretary Andrew Hatcher, who made the announcement, said that Johnson will confer at the White House at 8 o'clock tonight with both Democratic and Republican leaders of the House and Senate. The van that you see, we are assuming, is the vehicle in which the president's body, this is the undoubtedly the casket that is being brought forth. And from the vantage point that he has down there, ABC's Dick Bate will continue the commentary.
have been 
directly to the White House. The crowds are being kept well back away from the place where President Johnson made his remarks and now they've been kept well back away from the area where the helicopter will take off. this evening after the statement of a briefman in which he called for the help and of the American people and the help of God, the new president flies on to the White House aboard that helicopter to meet with Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and McGeorge Bundy, special assistant to the president. We take up the story now at the White House and ABC's Bob Clinton. President Johnson is now on his way to the White House in his first official visit to this famous resident of presidents. His first visit here as President of the United States. He does not intend to stay the night, we're told, but he will, this will become his home and his office. He is scheduling his business of being President immediately. As soon as he arrives at the White House, we are told, he will go into a conference with Secretary of Defense McNamara and with George Bundy, Special Assistant for National Security Affairs. And then at 8 o'clock tonight, he has asked the leaders of both houses of the Congress, Republicans as well as Democrats, to join him here for a conference. Tomorrow, we're told, there will be the first of the arrangements for the final tributes to President Kennedy. Mrs. Kennedy, 
will be in the group that will see the president first as his body lies in repose in the East Room of the White House from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. At 10, and perhaps it should be said often that this is not a public event here at the White House tomorrow, rather for the members of the family and the official family, at 10, the members of the Kennedy family will be visiting the East Room. At 11, President Johnson, the Speaker, those former presidents who may come, and those members of the executive branch of the government who hold presidential appointments. At 2 o'clock, the Supreme Court and federal judiciary. At 2.30, members of the Senate and the House, the governors of the states and territories, and at 5 o'clock, the diplomatic corps. Mrs. Kennedy was on the plane that brought the president back. She apparently has decided to ride with the body of her husband to Bethesda Naval Hospital and then return here to the White House. We believe that her children, Caroline and John Jr., have not yet been told of their father's death. John Ralston has been on this story a good share of the day. John, I'm sure you agree with me that President Johnson is coming to a place he knows well when he comes here, but certainly no man can know the duties of president until he assumes them. Yes, I think it's uh, very well to emphasize that President Johnson is uniquely well prepared for this job because of the way President Kennedy organized his government. In the past, when vice presidents have suddenly and unexpectedly assumed the presidency, they have often come in without knowing what's been going on. President Harry Truman said that he knew nothing about the office battle. He was, he was completely overwhelmed and appalled uh, uh, at having to take on without knowing. But Vice President Johnson has, from the very be beginning of the Kennedy administration, been in the highest councils of policy. He has uh, not only known what was going on, but he has participated in decisions uh, in, in every field, uh, from national security and foreign policy to, uh, to domestic policy. So he comes to the job of president, uniquely well prepared from that point of view. There comes to my mind tonight, John, the story he just told us about his own experience in the death of President Roosevelt. It just happened that Sam Rayburn, who was a great friend of Harry Truman's and a great admirer of Harry Truman's, had a feeling that Mr. Truman was not on very good terms with Mr. Roosevelt, was not knowing much of what was going on in the government. And so he said to a young friend of his, who was Lyndon Johnson, why don't you get a group of fellows together and we'll tell the Vice President of the United States that he has some friends that we like him if other people don't. So Mr. Johnson rounded up some half dozen, eight, I think it was, guests to come to Mr. Rayburn's office late one afternoon where they were going to tell Mr. Truman, the Vice President, that they were his friends. And instead, when Lyndon Johnson arrived, he was a little late, Mr. Rayburn was standing in the doorway saying, Mr. Truman just left in a hurry. He had a call from the White House. And as he left, Mr. Truman had turned to Mr. Rayburn to say, it's a funny thing, they asked me to come to the front door of the White House. Mr. Truman apparently left Mr. Rayburn's office that afternoon without knowing that he had become the President of the United States. Lyndon Johnson has known for some time that a Vice President, to serve his job well, to prepare for what may come, must be well prepared. But he has said several times, I remember not long ago him saying that he remembered the lesson they learned in Sam Rayburn's office when they stood and watched Mr. Truman go away to be President of the United States, knowing he was not prepared. And this idea, Bob, that you raised of uh, friendship uh, between President and Vice President, I think that there was a very high degree of mutual respect between these two men. And I think that one thing that contributed to it immensely uh, was the way uh, Mr. Johnson conceived and performed his job. It's very difficult to be a vice president uh, when a man is a great political figure in his own right. Certainly as active a man as Lyndon Johnson is indeed, and one who presumably uh, still still held a considerable political ambition. Because in the, vice, the vice president has to be uh, in office, a self-effacing man. Uh, he must not compete with the president, uh, either for public favor or for publicity. John, let me interrupt. I think now perhaps our audio feed is breaking up a little bit. The noise you may hear in these microphones now is the vice president's, this is the kind of mistake we're going to make here for some time, the president's helicopter arriving in the backyard. <coughs> we will talk here, John, as so they're off.
the helicopter has landed now on the White House lawn, as it has so often before with the late President Kennedy, bearing now the new President, Lyndon Johnson, the 37th President of the United States. The was born the White, in the backyard of the White House, one of the helicopters, and you see the familiar seal on the front steps, this, this is one of the helicopters used by the President, now this time by the new President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. He has come in from Andrews Air Force Base. This is about an eight-minute flight. Mrs. Johnson is in the doorway now. And again, escorted by the President, down the steps they come. Secretary McNamara behind them. Certainly all of us who realize something of the feelings of people in high places at times like this can wonder what has been in their thoughts as the President continues to confer with aides, people he knows and trusts, as he arrives in the yard, Mrs. McNamara exchange, Mr. McNamara exchanging words now with Mrs. Johnson. It was originally planned, now Elizabeth Montgomery, one of Mrs. Johnson's assistants in the picture, carrying an arm full of papers, and they go across the lawn of the White House toward the building that will now become the home of the Johnson family. We have not been told whether the two Johnson daughters are to be here this evening or not. It may have been perhaps that they were in Texas because it had been expected. And now as we see, the Mrs. Johnson, the new First Lady, is being led away. She apparently is not going to go into the building tonight. Instead is staying out of the activity which is essential to her husband as he works in his new duties. John Rawson and I were saying that the Vice President has, was especially prepared for this job. Certainly, John, it's true that the men who were in the President's cabinet, President Kennedy's cabinet, know the Vice President well. Some of them, of course, perhaps all of them, will be asked to stay on. This is, however, a choice that the President makes because it is his cabinet, just as now this is his home. The changes, I, I, would, I would think, uh, well, this is very highly speculative, they, I would think not come very suddenly, uh, or would be very many for a while. I would uh, also think in view of the great support that as Vice President, Mr. Johnson gave President Kennedy's program, uh, that he might uh, very soon uh, announce his intention to pursue that program. This is uh, not only a matter of tradition, uh, but this is something that I think uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, can do very well. You know, there have been uh, among his opponents a number of uh, stories circulated lately and uh, jokes about his uh, uh, being out of the public eye. And, uh, I think uh, that at least in many places around the country, perhaps small numbers of people, uh, many people should have known in many places that Lyndon Johnson has been extremely active in this country, making speeches on behalf of the president's program, uh, as well as doing a, a good many political chores around the country for President Kennedy. Certainly John and your role as congressional correspondent for ABC, you've talked with him as I have. It's been a little surprising, I think, to find so much modesty in a man that we knew first and best in our earlier days here as a man who loved to take the lapels of another senator and be as persuasive as he possibly could for some project in which he was interested. I think this is a, uh, a tribute to his uh, political wisdom uh, that he uh, can change roles and become uh, the kind of politician that duty demands in a particular office, uh, even though it's a great change from his uh, previous role. Yeah. He was, of course, in the, in the Senate, a uh, very prominent uh, figure in the Vice Presidency, uh, self-effacing, as I said. Uh, but this is uh, the difference in what the jobs demand. He adapted very readily. And I think he was reasonably happy in this job. You know, we remember talking with him as I we were together one day when we asked him if he really liked it, and he said he never was happier in his life. Now, this was not a political man who told you an untruth with great success. Lyndon Johnson learned early that he had the kind of face that if he wanted to tell you the untruth, he better not try it, he better say he had nothing to say. This, I think, was another one of those lessons he learned from Mr. Rayburn. He was not the kind of a man who lied to us very often. And when he said he really enjoyed the job he was in, I think he did.
first pictures of the arrival of President Lyndon Johnson, the 37th President of the United States. He was born, by the way, near Stonewall, Texas, on August 27, 1908. A piece of irony there. He was first elected to Congress in 1938 to fill an unexpired term, served in Congress till 1949 when he was elected to the Senate, there serving as minority leader, and then became leader of the Democratic majority. Johnson served as majority leader until 1960 when he was nominated for the vice presidency. President Johnson was sworn into office an hour and a half after President Kennedy's assassination. That ceremony took place in the presidential plane at the Dallas airport. President Kennedy's widow, Jacqueline Kennedy, was at Johnson's side, and so was Johnson's wife, Lady Bird. <laughs> He had seen, and he sent the navigator back and asked me to come up and listen to the broadcast. So I did, and we heard it, and uh, I was stunned. And he said, "I've now heard it enough." Howard think, Smith, to ABC. Make a to uh, make an announcement to the 153 passengers on the plane, which he then did. I then went back into the cabin, and everyone was silent and stunned. I think the the reaction was universal on the plane, and I gather everywhere else. People simply could not believe that this energetic, vigorous young man who had not yet even reached the climax of his presidential term, who still had all his biggest legislation ahead of him, still waiting to be acted upon, you just couldn't believe that he'd been, uh, he'd, he'd been shot down in mid-passage. And uh, there were no sounds. The only opinion I heard, I'm afraid, was my own. Someone finally said to me, what do you think? And I said, I think there are just too many nuts abroad in our nation. There are too many people who are preaching uh, disrespect for courts and law. There are too many people who put too much emphasis on the direct approach instead of arguing, let's hit or shoot. It's not a very original opinion, and it's not a very intelligent one, but that's still the only one that I can summon. As someone told me in Wall Street today, where I learned about this news, uh, he hopes that uh, whoever it was was soundly deranged, because this might be the only way in which any forgiveness for this heinous crime could be expressed. Um, Howard, we have a new president in power now. Do you have any immediate thoughts without uh, thinking, having had too much time because of this trip back, in thinking about what Mr. Johnson's uh, program might be? Will it be uh, dissimilar at all from the late president's? Well, uh, this is absolutely no recommendation for him, but I've always thought extremely highly of him. I think he is a superb politician, and I believe that we need just exactly that in the presidency, and uh, it, it, it would be useful right now because there's so much important legislation that has to be acted on, and I think almost everybody now admits, except a few people in Congress, that congressional, the record of Congress is pretty bad. And uh, I think that he is, he's been missed as a leader of the Senate. So I think he will probably follow the president's same policies. I've heard him make speeches on civil rights in which he's been rather more vigorous than the president has been. I, uh, I, the Negro Press Club in Washington had a banquet recently, and he was the main speaker, and I was present. And uh, he, he told a joke. He said, uh, I must tell you that when you phoned and told my wife you wanted me to, to come here and speak to you, she asked who you were, and you explained it. and. Uh, and I think the Baptist preacher's joke fits that. He said once upon a time the, uh, the Baptist preacher down in Texas got a call on the telephone. The man said, I'm from Internal Revenue. I'd like to know if Mr. Jones of your congregation has made a $500 contribution to the church. And uh, the, uh, the preacher said, uh, could you tell me where you're from again? He said, I'm from the Revenue Service. And the preacher said, well, he did or he will. And uh, he has always been very congenial in talking about these things and very forceful. I expect he'll be a good president. In the area of foreign relations, he was certainly a, a strong man in the Foreign Relations Committee. Do you see any area in our foreign affairs programs or policies that might be beefed up or changed as a result of this? No, I really think the basic things, the president, uh, the, the late President Kennedy had, had things in, in pretty good shape in spite of a great deal of criticism. I think he really did the two things in the Cold War which, are, which you have to do to have a good policy. He had a, lot, a great deal of force. He rebuilt our conventional forces until they could meet just about any threat. And at the same time, he was being conciliatory. 
he was he was saying yes instead of no to a great many things and he signed this test ban treaty and so on so i think we're on the track on those things i'm not sure that there's much new that johnson can can contribute he can continue those policies it's interesting to note too that the dominican republic has decreed three days of mourning because of mr kennedy's death that's the first area abroad to make such a widespread uh, declaration of mourning. Uh, Dominican President de Los Santos declared that his government and people extended their sympathies to the United States. The President issued a statement declaring Mr. Kennedy's death a great loss to the world, especially the free world. And Dominican radio stations stopped all regular programming and began, began broadcasting only morning music and the Dominican flag was lowered to half-mast. Also, from abroad, uh, Sir Winston Churchill said tonight, the assassination of President Kennedy is a monstrous act, as he called it, which has taken from us a great statesman, a wise and valiant man. The World War II leader will be 89 on November 30th. He issued that statement, of course, from his London residence after listening to television accounts of the president's death. The loss to the United States and to the world is incalculable, Sir Winston declared. Those who come after Mr. Kennedy must strive the more to achieve the ideals of world peace and human happiness and dignity to which his presidency was so dedicated. From the New York State AFL-CIO, as these reactions continue to pour in, we have one from Raymond R. Corbett, president of the two million member State AFL-CIO, said the world lost a friend when President Kennedy was assassinated. He said in this statement, words are unable to express our grief and sense of loss in the untimely death of the president, a man and a leader of most uncommon ability and stature, of deep sympathy and understanding for the needs of the people of our nation and the world. The news of the assassination, by the way, and the other side of business from labor management, if you will, brought almost an immediate closing of the New York Stock Exchange. Change of station. It closed from NBC from Andrews Air Force Base, made a few minutes ago with Robert Abernathy and Nancy Dickerson. Chet. Here is a picture of the swearing-in of the 36th President of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson. We understand that he was sworn in during the sad flight back to Washington from Dallas. On the right of your screen, you see Mrs. Kennedy, President Johnson, and Mrs. Johnson. He was sworn in by uh, Federal District Judge Hughes of Dallas, Texas, so we are given to understand. The assassination took place in Dallas as President Kennedy rode in the cavalcade toward the trademark where he was to have lunch and then make a speech. This is what happened beginning shortly before the shots were fired. The voice is that of Charles Murphy of station WBAP, Fort Worth. This was a scene near the Stimmons Expressway. In front, no, this is in front of City Hall in downtown Dallas, a mile east of the shooting scene. Heavy crowds line the downtown streets to view the presidential party. As in all of the Texas stops, there were many teenagers attracted there by the First Lady and the President. This is Main Street in Dallas. Is this moving west? This is moving west toward the fatal moment. motorcade is traveling at about 20 to 25 miles an hour, slowly westward down Main Street in the heart of Dallas. The time, about 12.20. During the noon hour, heavy crowds from downtown offices lining the route. That looks like the school depository building on the right. I'm not sure. This, this is the scene of confusion. Something has happened here. The cameraman running toward the scene to the presidential car ahead of him. We caught just a blurred glance of the old school depository building from which the sniper fired the shot. This is the reaction from the crowd. All is confusion at the scene. Here a woman shelters herself. Now racing toward the hospital on Stimmons Freeway, past the trademark to the right where the president was to have spoken, where he was to have criticized the fanatical right. 
for our own picket. That is Parkland Hospital, a mile and a half to two miles from the shooting scene. Parkland Hospital, where the president died in Dallas. By the time these films were shot, of course, the presidential car was already at the hospital. This is Major General Clifton, the military aide of the president, press secretary going into the hospital. That was silent film of the events along the presidential line of ride, immediately surrounding the fatal moment and described later by reporter Murphy. Thousands had massed 10 and 12 deep along the curb to see the President of the United States. The assassination happened so swiftly, and the motorcade sped off so quickly that few saw it actually taking place. A Dallas man had taken his small son to see the President. Here he tells what he saw. Unfortunately, I was probably 15 to 20 feet away from the President when it happened. That was exactly what you saw, sir. He was coming down the street, and my five-year-old boy and myself were by ourselves on the grass there on Palmer Street, and I asked Joe to wave to him, and Joe waved, and I waved, and the man... The man... That's all right, sir. You were in Because he, he was waving back. He was... He was the shot rang out and he slumped down in the seat and his wife reached up toward him and as he, as he was slumping down and the second shot went off and it just knocked him down from, from the seat. The two shots. Two shots. Did you see the man who did the... No, sir, I did not see the man who did it. I, I, all, I, all I did was look in the man's face when he was shot there and saw that expression on his face and he grabbed himself and slide. And the second one, whenever it went, why, I'm positive that it hit him. I hope it didn't, but I'm positive that it hit him and, it's, and he went all the way down in the car. Then they speeded up and I didn't know what was going on, so I just grabbed the boy and fell on him in hopes that there wasn't a maniac around here. It's a logical assumption that hatred, far left, far right, political, religious, economic, or paranoic, moved the person or persons who today committed this combined act of murder and national sabotage. There is in this country, and there has been for too long, an ominous and sickening popularity of hatred. The body of the president lying at this moment in Washington is the thundering testimonial of what hatred comes to and the revolting excesses it perpetrates. Hatred is self-generating, contagious, it feeds upon itself and explodes into violence. It is no inexplicable phenomenon that there are pockets of hatred in our country, areas and communities where the disease is permitted or encouraged or given status by those who can and do influence others. You and I have heard in recent months someone say those Kennedys ought to be shot. A well-known national magazine recently carried an article saying Chief Justice Warren should be hanged. In its own defense, it said it was only joking. But the left has been equally bad. Tonight, it might be the hope and the resolve of all of us that we've heard the last of this kind of talk, jocular or serious, for the result is tragically the same. David? The news reached the White House, which was almost empty at the time, on the news wires. And during the day, the Army has been there helping to make the funeral arrangements. Members of Vice Presidents, now President Lyndon Johnson's staff, have been there making other arrangements. NBC Robert Gorolsky has been there all day, and here is his report on what has happened at the White House. It was about 1.30 this afternoon here at the White House. It was virtually deserted, most members of the staff were with the president in Texas. Two secretaries, Helen Gans and Nancy Larson, were sitting in the press office opening routine mail. The phone rang, it was a news agency asking permission to have one of its reporters who didn't have a White House press pass to enter the executive mansion. One of the girls said, why? Nothing's happening here. At the other end of the line, the voice said, because the president's been shot. The girls raced into a small cubicle where the teletype printers were clattering. There was the bulletin confirming what they had just heard. The highest ranking remaining members of the White House staff were immediately informed, McGeorge Bundy and Ted Sorensen. They tried to call Dallas, but it was impossible. 
like the rest of the nation, they sat, unbelieving and shocked, watching television and listening to radio reports on what was happening. There was a prayerful silence as White House staffers, newsmen, and photographers began the long vigil. There was nothing that could be done in the presidential mansion. When word was flashed that the president was dead, there was no rush for phones. There was only the quiet of mourning and still disbelief. Only when the American flag was lowered to half-staff was there mournful recognition that it was true. On the second floor of the executive mansion, six-year-old Caroline and three-year-old John Jr. were napping. They had their lunch, Caroline, after attending morning classes in the White House first grade. They still don't know that their father is dead. Two of Lyndon Johnson's aides arrived at the White House early this afternoon, presumably to prepare for the transition. Senator Edward Kennedy and Eunice Shriver, the president's brother and sister, came to the White House and then took off for Hyannisport to be with their parents. Newsmen crowded around the White House getting details on the funeral arrangements which were being taken care of by the late president's brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver. Then there was more waiting, waiting for the new president of the United States to begin his duties. Robert Kuralski, NBC News at the White House. A funeral mass will be said, all of the funeral arrangements, as Robert Goralski has reported, are not complete, but a funeral mass will be said Monday in the shrine of the Immaculate Conception here in Washington for the president by Richard Car Cardinal Cushing of Boston. During the day, General Eisenhower, when he got the news, was interviewed briefly by reporters, so here we go now to General Eisenhower and a brief interview with reporters this evening. I share the sense of shock and dismay that the entire nation must feel at the despicable act that took the life of the nation's president. On the personal side, Mrs. Eisenhower and I share the grief that Mrs. Kennedy must now feel, and we send to her our fair, prayerful thoughts and sympathetic sentiments at this, in this hour. Well, General, how would you counsel the American people at this time? In the face of such a terrible thing, I'm sure the uh, entire citizenry of the nation will join the one man in expressing their, not only their grief, but their indi indignation at this act and we'll stand faithfully behind the government. General, could you tell us how you got the word? I was at a meeting uh, for the United Nations, and uh, while there, a member of the meeting was called out, and they came back and told us the news. Although at that time, uh, uh, we did not know the president was dead. We did not know when I got back here at that time that he was dead. But. Uh, Matter of fact, we had a, the last message we had was one rather of hope. And the entire company uh, merely paused for a minute at the request of the chairman and each of us in his own way uh, said a silent prayer for the president. Should there be any concerns sir, over national security at a time like this? No, I think the whole nation now would be uh, almost all of us Security agents. Will the nation be all right in a few months ahead? Oh, I'm not going to uh, predict anything of that. I just say this. The American nation is a people of great common sense. And they are not going to be stampeded or bewildered. None of us will ever forget where he was and how he felt when the news was announced. In New York City, for a handful of people, the place was the sidewalk beside the open door of NBC News reporter Gabe Pressman's automobile, listening to the loudspeaker, the car radio. They had known for some minutes that the president was gravely wounded. Then came the instant when the worst was confirmed. A flash from Dallas. Two priests who were with President Kennedy say he is dead. A bullet wound. This is the latest information we have from Dallas. Of course, standing by to give you all available information as it comes to us. I will repeat with the greatest regret this flash. Two priests who are with President Kennedy say he has died of bullet wounds. 
kind of hard to believe. Uh, your source is big enough. Hard to believe. Hard to believe is real. I don't know what to say. All I know whoever catches them, they deserve the worst. I did. We were stunned silence and groping to come to terms with a fact that was almost beyond belief. The face and voice of a young girl summed it up. It was much the same all across the country, a wave of shock. Here in Chicago at the same hour, Floyd Calvert reports from NBC News, Chicago. Ask him for sound and picture of it. In Chicago, gray clouds hung low and a fine drizzle of rain fell when the first word of the tragedy was heard. Learning that the president was critically wounded, stunned Chicagoans turned to their churches, leaving their offices in the loop, their homes and businesses in the suburbs. When confirmation came a short while later that the president's wounds were fatal, the grief of the mourners became more evident. In tears, looks of dazed disbelief. In some churches, priests and ministers took to the pulpit to offer eulogies and lead their congregations in prayer. In most cases, the churches were simply open as a haven for those wishing to add their prayers to the millions of others around the world, to recite the rosary, or simply to light a candle. Floyd Calvert, NBC News, Chicago. In Washington, where everything, everything revolves around the government, and this is a company town, really, and where the president is uh, more than any one person revolves around him, and where, in many cases, the grief today was personal among people who knew him and worked for him. Here are a few pictures, rather random in nature, of some of the sites around Washington today. on embassies as well as on all other public buildings at half staff. That incidentally is a Russian embassy. This is Lafayette Park, immediately across Pennsylvania Avenue from the White House, where as soon as the first news came out, people began to gather and stand, as they often do, just stand. sidewalk immediately in front of the White House. St. Matthew's Cathedral is a few blocks from the White House. I rushed up to the chair and said, Senator, Senator Kennedy, your brother, the president, has been shot. He gave up a jerk with his body. His body tensed, but he was absolutely calm. And as I recall, Senator Kennedy, then presiding over the Senate, when he heard this awful news, said no, and that was all. That was Robert Riddell, a member of the staff of the U.S. Senate who took the news here to Senator Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, who is here with his sister Eunice, leaving in a helicopter for Andrews Base, where they then took a jet plane to Otis Air Force Base in Massachusetts. Now some comments from members of the Senate. 
We knew him and loved him in West Virginia. I think he loved us. Mountaineers uh, can hardly express their, their sadness at his going. And this afternoon, I hope in just these few rather faltering words, I can speak at least in part for the people of my state. This good, this decent, this kindly man, this harassed man who had so much on his shoulders and received from some people so little in the way of support in return, this man has now gone to his reward. There are some things that are simply incredible and leave one absolutely speechless. This is one of them. The assassin's bullet has removed from the most vital station on earth a brilliant and dedicated young statesman at the very height of his powers. And I know that all Americans no matter where they come from or how they are made or in God's fashion, will rally in support behind the President of the United States, uh, Lyndon Johnson. Those are comments from members of the Senate, both parties. Chet? Dallas police are holding a suspect in the President's assassination, 24-year-old Lee H. Oswald. Shortly after the president and Governor Connolly were shot, police chased Oswald into a movie theater. Police said he fired at them, killing patrolman J.D. Tippett. A rifle was found in a building where he worked. Oswald once served in the United States Marines. In 1959, he was in Moscow, where he said he wanted to become a Russian citizen, saying that leaving this country was like getting out of a prison. But last summer, he was back in the United States. In New Orleans, police arrested him after he got into a fight while distributing literature for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, an organization that at least sympathizes with the Castro government. At that time, Oswald was interviewed by station WDSU-TV in New Orleans. Here is some of that interview. ready to go during your last spot if you want to place it in there somewhere. Sir. see we lost the audio portion of the interview the boy said that he was a marxist not a communist perhaps a little later in the program we can try to run the film again john fitzgerald kennedy was 46 years old last may he had been president since january 20th 1961 he was born to wealth he was devoted to the public service not unlike thousands of others john f kennedy experienced the pain the boredom the moments of combat fear and came home a lean and lanky war hero with a history degree from Harvard and a quickly demonstrated talent for politics. He won his contest for a seat in the 80th Congress in 1946 and served three terms in the House. In 1952, he challenged incumbent Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. and won his place in the Senate. The nation was first aware of John F. Kennedy at the Democratic Convention in 1956 when he lost the vice presidential nomination. Then came 1960, Senator Kennedy's announcement of candidacy. The primary campaigns in Wisconsin and West Virginia, the convention in Los Angeles featuring a public debate with his arch rival, Senator, now President Lyndon Johnson, and the surprise announcement that Senator Johnson would join Kennedy on the Democratic ticket. Then there was the campaign, the innovation of the famous Kennedy-Nixon debates, the long excruciating hours of election night with the Kennedy family gathered in the big frame house on Cape Cod. One by one, cabinet officers were announced, the inauguration came and went, 
and the administration of John F. Kennedy began with these inaugural words. inauguration speech excerpts from it. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you and Almighty God, the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. The world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hand the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And yet the same revolutionary belief for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and full life that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the small undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. <laughs> Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. <laughs> this much we pledge and more. To those old allies whose cultural and spiritual origins we share, we pledge the loyalty of faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do. For we dare not meet a powerful challenge at all and split asunder. For those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, we pledge our word that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. We shall not always expect to find them supporting our view, but we shall always hope to find them strongly supporting their own freedom. And to remember that in the past, those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger, ended up inside. <laughs> to those people in the huts and villages of half the globe, struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. For whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. 
if a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. <laughs> to our sister republic, south of our border, we offer a special pledge to convert our good words into good deeds. In a new alliance for progress, to assist free men and free government in casting off the chains of poverty. But this peaceful revolution of hope cannot become the prey of hostile powers. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas. And let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. <laughs> to that World Assembly of Sovereign States, the United Nations, our last best hope in an age where the instruments of war have far outpaced the instruments of peace, we renew our pledge of support to prevent it from becoming merely a form for invective, to strengthen its shield of the new and the weak, and to enlarge the area in which its risk may run. Finally, for those nations who would make themselves our adversary, we offer not a pledge, but a request that both sides begin anew the quest for peace. Before the dark powers of destruction, unleashed by science, engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction. We dare not tempt them with weakness, for only when our arms are sufficient beyond doubt can we be certain beyond doubt that they will never be employed. But neither can two great and powerful groups of nations take comfort from our present course, both sides overburdened by the cost of modern weapons, both rightly alarmed by the steady spread of the deadly atom, yet both racing to order that uncertain balance of terror that stays the hand of mankind's final war. So let us begin anew, remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Let both sides explore what problems unite us instead of belaboring those problems which divide us. Let both sides, for the first time, formulate serious and precise proposals for the inspection and control of arms and bring the absolute power to destroy other nations under the absolute control of all nations. Let both sides seek to invoke the wonders of science instead of its terrors. Together, let us explore the stars, conquer the desert, eradicate disease, tap the ocean depth, and encourage the arts and commerce. Let both sides unite to heed in all corners of the earth the command of Isaiah to undo the heavy burden and let the oppressed go free. And if a beachhead of cooperation may push back the jungle of suspicion, let both sides join in creating a new endeavor, not a new balance of power, but a new world of law where the strong are just and the weak secure and the peace preserved. 
All this will not be finished in the first 100 days. Nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days. Nor in the life of this administration. Nor even perhaps in our lifetime on this planet. But let us begin. In your hands, my fellow citizens, more than mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answered the call of service around the globe. Now the trumpet summons us again. Now as they call to bear arms, the arms we need. Now as a call to battle, so in battle we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, a struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. Can we forge against these enemies a grand and global alliance, north and south, east and west, that can assure a more fruitful life for all mankind? Will you join in that historic effort? In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. <laughs> My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. <laughs> Finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us here the same high standard of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward, with history the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. That was the inaugural speech of John F. Kennedy, January 1961. Crises were not long delayed. Precisely three months after entering the White House, the President stood before the nation to acknowledge the Bay of Pigs fiasco. There followed the first trip to Europe and an inconclusive meeting with Khrushchev in Vienna. The Berlin issue grew more intense through those summer weeks of 1961. And on the night of August 12th, the Communists built the Berlin Wall, and the President elected not to respond with force. A few days later, on August 16th, the Alliance for Progress was announced in the White House before a gathering of Latin American diplomats. In December, the President paid a visit to Latin America. 1962 is the year of trial. 
In April, the president faced off with the steel industry and a sizable section of the American business community. That autumn, a Negro youth by the name of James Meredith attempted to enter the University of Mississippi, and it required the action of the president to get him in and keep him there safely. In October, President Kennedy issued notice on Premier Khrushchev to remove his missiles and other big weapons from Cuba. The president led us to look for a few hours squarely at the possibility of nuclear war with these words. Only last Thursday, as evidence of this rapid offensive buildup was already in my hand, Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko told me in my office that he was instructed to make it clear once again, as he said his government had already done, that Soviet assistance to Cuba, and I quote, pursued solely the purpose of contributing to the defense capabilities of Cuba, unquote. That, and I quote him, training by Soviet specialists of Cuban nationals in handling defensive armaments was by no means offensive. And that if it were otherwise, Mr. Gamico went on, the Soviet government would never become involved in rendering such assistance, unquote. That statement also was false. Neither the United States of America nor the world community of nations can tolerate deliberate deception and offensive threats on the part of any nation, large or small. We no longer live in a world where only the actual firing of weapons represents a sufficient challenge to a nation's security to constitute maximum peril. Nuclear weapons are so destructive and ballistic missiles are so swift that any substantially increased possibility of their use or any sudden change in their deployment may well be regarded as a definite threat to peace. For many years, both the Soviet Union and the United States, recognizing this fact, have deployed strategic nuclear weapons with great care, never upsetting the precarious status quo which ensured that these weapons would not be used in the absence of some vital challenge. Our own strategic missiles have never been transferred to the territory of any other nation under a cloak of secrecy and deception. And our history, unlike that of the Soviets since the end of World War II, demonstrates that we have no desire to dominate or conquer any other nation or impose our system upon its people. Nevertheless, American citizens have become adjusted to living daily on the bullseye of Soviet missiles located inside the USSR or in submarines. In that sense, missiles in Cuba add to an already clear and present danger. Although it should be noted, the nations of Latin America have never previously been subjected to a potential nuclear threat. But this secret, swift, extraordinary buildup of communist missiles in an area well known to have a special and historical relationship to the United States and the nations of the Western Hemisphere in violation of Soviet assurances and in defiance of American and hemispheric policy. This sudden clandestine decision to station strategic weapons for the first time outside of Soviet soil is a deliberately provocative an unjustified change in the status quo, which cannot be accepted by this country, if our courage and our commitments are ever to be trusted again by either friend or foe. The 1930s taught us a clear lesson. Aggressive conduct, if allowed to go unchecked and unchallenged, ultimately leads to war. This nation is opposed to war. We are also true to our word. Our unswerving objective, therefore, must be to prevent the use of these missiles against this or any other country and to secure their withdrawal or elimination from the Western Hemisphere. Our policy has been one of patience and restraint, as befits a peaceful and powerful nation which leads a worldwide alliance. We have been determined not to be diverted from our central concerns by mere irritants and fanatics. But now further action is required, and it is underway, and these actions may only be the beginning. We will not prematurely or unnecessarily risk the course of worldwide nuclear war in which even the fruits of victory would be ashes in our mouth. 
but neither will we shrink from that risk at any time it must be faced. Acting, therefore, in the defense of our own security and of the entire Western Hemisphere, and under the authority entrusted to me by the Constitution, as endorsed by the resolution of the Congress, I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. First, to halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. This quarantine will be extended, if needed, to other types of cargo and carriers. We are not at this time, however, denying the necessities of life, as the Soviets attempted to do in their Berlin blockade of 1948. Second, I have directed the continued and increased close surveillance of Cuba and its military buildup. The foreign ministers of the OAS, in their communique of October 6, rejected secrecy on such matters in this hemisphere. Should these offensive military preparations continue, thus increasing the threat to the hemisphere, further action will be justified. I have directed the armed forces to prepare for any eventualities, and I trust that in the interest of both the Cuban people and the Soviet technicians at the sites, the hazards to all concerned of continuing this threat will be recognized. Third, it shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Fourth, as a necessary military precaution, I have reinforced our base at Guantanamo, evacuated today the dependence of our personnel there, and ordered additional military units to be on a standby alert basis. Fifth, we are calling tonight for an immediate meeting of the Organization of Consultation under the Organization of American States to consider this threat to hemispheric security and to invoke Article 6 and 8 of the Rio Treaty in support of all necessary action. The United Nations Charter allows for regional security arrangements, and the nations of this hemisphere decided long ago against the military presence of outside powers. Our other allies around the world have also been alerted. Sixth, under the Charter of the United Nations, we are asking tonight that an emergency meeting of the Security Council be convoked without delay to take action against this latest Soviet threat to world peace. Our resolution will call for the prompt dismantling and withdrawal of all offensive weapons in Cuba under the supervision of UN observers before the quarantine can be lifted. Seventh and finally, I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to halt and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace and the stable relations between our two nations. I call upon him further to abandon this course of world domination and to join in an historic effort to end the perilous arms race and to transform the history of man. He has an opportunity now to move the world back from the abyss of destruction by returning to his government's own words that it had no need to station missiles outside its own territory and withdrawing these weapons from Cuba by refraining from any action which will widen or deepen the present crisis and then by participating in a search for peaceful and permanent solutions. This nation is prepared to present its case against the Soviet threat to peace and our own proposals for a peaceful world at any time and in any forum in the OAS, in the United Nations, or in any other meeting that could be useful without limiting our freedom of action. We have in the past made strenuous efforts to limit the spread of nuclear weapons. We have proposed the elimination of all arms and military bases in a fair and effective disarmament treaty. We are prepared to discuss new proposals for the removal of tensions on both sides, including the possibilities of a genuinely independent Cuba free to determine its own destiny. 
We have no wish to war with the Soviet Union, for we are a peaceful people who desire to live in peace with all other peoples. But it is difficult to settle or even discuss these problems in an atmosphere of intimidation. That is why this latest Soviet threat, or any other threat, which is made either independently or in response to our actions this week, must and will be met with determination. Any hostile move anywhere in the world against the safety and freedom of peoples to whom we are committed, including in particular the brave people of West Berlin, will be met by whatever action is needed. Finally, I want to say a few words to the captive people of Cuba, to whom this speech is being directly carried by special radio facilities. I speak to you as a friend, as one who knows of your deep attachment to your fatherland, as one who shares your aspirations for liberty and justice for all. And I have watched, and the American people have watched, with deep sorrow, how your nationalist revolution was betrayed and how your fatherland fell under foreign domination. Now your leaders are no longer Cuban leaders, inspired by Cuban ideals. They are puppets and agents of an international conspiracy, which has turned Cuba against your friends and neighbors in the Americas, and turned it into the first Latin American country to become a target for nuclear war, the first Latin American country to have these weapons on its soil. These new weapons are not in your interest. They contribute nothing to your peace and well-being. They can only undermine it. But this country has no wish to cause you to suffer or to impose any system upon you. We know that your lives and land are being used as pawns by those who deny your freedom. No, no, this is too hard. Many times in the past, no, 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 the Debbie. Cuban people have risen to throw out tyrants who destroy their liberty. And I have no doubt that most Cubans today look forward to the time when they will be truly free, free from foreign domination, free to choose their own leaders, free to select their own system, free to own their own land, free to speak and write and worship without fear or degradation. And then shall Cuba be welcomed back to the society of free nations and to the associations of this hemisphere. My fellow citizens, let no one doubt that this is a difficult and dangerous effort on which we have set out. No one can foresee precisely what course it will take or what costs or casualties will be incurred. Many months of sacrifice and self-discipline lie ahead, months in which both our patience and our will will be tested, months in which many threats and denunciations will keep us aware of our dangers, but the greatest danger of all would be to do nothing. The path we have chosen for the present is full of hazards, as all paths are, but it is the one most consistent with our character and courage as a nation and our commitments around the world. The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. And one path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender or submission. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere and we hope around the world, God willing, that goal will be achieved. Okay. And ignominiously, with the world watching intently, Khrushchev took his missiles home. This may well have been the supreme moment of the Kennedy career, and likewise, it may have marked a turning point in history's ultimate judgment of Nikita Khrushchev. For after that, he never seemed quite so fearsome as he did before. There was another trip to Europe for the president, vigorous discussion of taxes, unemployment, and civil rights. In scores of communities, Negroes began demonstrating, and some said the president was avoiding the issue. Two Negro youngsters applied for admission to the University of Alabama, and again the president ensured their safe conduct. He delivered a speech to the nation. This is not a sectional issue. Difficulties over segregation and discrimination exist in every city, in every state of the Union, producing in many cities a rising tide of discontent that threatens the public safety. 
nor is this a partisan issue. In a time of domestic crisis, men of goodwill and generosity should be able to unite regardless of party or politics. This is not even a legal or legislative issue alone. It is better to settle these matters in the courts than on the streets, and new laws are needed at every level. But law alone cannot make men see right. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. Whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot send his children to the best public school available, if he cannot vote for the public officials who represent him, if in short he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay one hundred years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. They are not yet, not yet freed from social and economic oppression. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. We preach freedom around the world, and we mean it. And we cherish our freedom here at home. But are we to say to the world, and much more importantly, to each other, that this is a land of the free, except for the Negroes? That we have no second-class citizens, except Negroes? That we have no class or caste system, no ghettos, no master race, except with respect to Negroes? Now the time has come for this nation to fulfill its promise. The events in Birmingham and elsewhere have so increased the cries for equality that no city or state or legislative body can prudently choose to ignore them. The fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets, in demonstrations, parades and protests which create tensions and threaten violence and threaten lives. We face therefore a moral crisis as a country and a people. It cannot be met by repressive police action. It cannot be left to increase demonstrations in the streets. It cannot be quieted by token moves or talk. It is a time to act in the Congress, in your state and local legislative body and above all, in all of our daily lives. It is not enough to pin the blame on others, to say this is a problem of one section of the country or another, or to pour the facts that we face. A great change is at hand, and our task, our obligation, is to make that revolution, that change, peaceful and constructive for all. Those who do nothing are inviting shame as well as violence. Those who act boldly are recognizing right as well as reality. Next week, I shall ask the Congress of the United States to act, to make a commitment it is not fully made in this century to the proposition that race has no place in American life or law. The federal judiciary has upheld that proposition in a series of forthright cases. The executive branch has adopted that proposition in the conduct of its affairs including the employment of federal personnel. In the last two weeks, over 75 cities have seen progress made in desegregating these kinds of facilities. But many are unwilling to act alone. And for this reason, nationwide legislation is needed if we are to move this problem from the streets to the courts. I'm also asking Congress to authorize the federal government to participate more fully in lawsuits designed to end segregation in public education. We have succeeded in persuading many districts to desegregate voluntarily. 
Dozens have admitted Negroes without violence. Today, a Negro is attending a state-supported institution in every one of our 50 states. But the pace is very slow. Too many Negro children entering segregated grade schools at the time of the Supreme Court's decision nine years ago